right? No. Um, let's have a look at that. So I'm just uh, pulled a quote from a chief state um, epidemiologist, impossible to pronounce, um, back in early 2020. And I think this tells you quite a lot. And the fact is that experts are generally more overconfident than they should. So why am I talking about this? Let's talk about the problem. Well, imagine that you're, you're an astronaut and you're, you're uh, uh, going to Mars uh, with the first group of uh, pioneers. And um, you're told by NASA that you have a magic um, instruction in your wallet. Um, and when you arrive to Mars, and for some reason you spot a problem, the thrusters are broken, maybe something is wrong with the oxygen tank, in worst case, and you open the magic instruction and the magic instruction tells you this. Please iterate, um, run in sprints. Of course, no one sells uh, astronauts to Mars with this type of instructions or you know, this type of preparations. And you wouldn't, right? So in my profession, um, helping companies uh, adopt, use Agile, make it work, it could be seen like a similar exercise. You know that you're gonna send to a, be sent to a new planet. You have a map of some sorts, and all you know is that the map is gonna be completely useless after one month, or even maybe a couple of days. Uh, so that doesn't help you a lot. What does help you is understand how do I you know, decide and resolve uh, the situations that I'm seeing. So we make a lot of decisions. And one of the qualities that I would say that we are aiming for if we're trying to go agile is that we improve the speed of decision cycles. But are we? Right? Or what does it take? So I'm the pretty uh, difficult guy who always tries to check um, if people um, you know, uh, are as good as they say. So. Here's a small test I invite for you. Um, I'm gonna ask you to you know, give it a try, answer a couple of very simple problems um, and within a limited time box. And it's okay if you choose not to answer them, it's up to you, but it's an interesting small uh, exercise. Uh, to run it, what you need is pen and paper. Um, we're just gonna ask like five simple questions, so it's no big deal, but here's an invitation for you, right? So a little warm up here before we get going. What's the answer to this? Of course, you know that. What's the answer to this? Calculate that. And if you ask this question, this. Well, it's 80. Okay, that was just a little bit warm up to enable you to get into focus. Are you ready to go? Right, let's crack on. Now, for the next two problems, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to answer it. Let's go. Imagine that you're standing in front of a cube. The cube can be flipped to the sides, forward and backward. You see these instructions. Uh, in the bottom of the cube, there's a dot. The instructions are, the cube now rolls. Where is the dot now? All right, let's go to problem two. A mother and daughter are 60 years together. The mother is 36 years older than the daughter. 
How old are they? All right, so now we go to a couple of smaller um, um, uh, decisions here. Uh, and first, a small check here. This is still a problem. You have two wheels. Which of the two wheels rotates faster? Okay, first, a small instruction for the next um, problem here. The idea is that you need to find the next correct in sequence. So in this small example, imagine that you have this series of figures. Which one is the right fit? So this is just so as a small instruction. So it be A, B, C, or D. Well, the correct choice in this uh, example is D, um, because the number of sides is improving, uh, growing by each uh, uh, figure. So, are you ready with the next? All right, relax, uh, shoulders down. Um, let me show you the correct answers. Um, imagine you get one point for each. So these are the correct answers. Feel free to double check your, your own um, uh, small experiment here. Uh, see, you know, learn for yourself how you did. And I mean, there could be several different um, options here. Um, Anything from, uh, are you crazy? The time was way too short to figure this out. <laughs> to like, if you score five points, well, um, congratulations, that wasn't bad. Uh, you should apply for uh, some astronaut training or similar. But the interesting thing is, if you thought the time was way too short here, this is not the real test. The real test, if you do this, is how you think. So imagine that you're starting off, you see a problem and you think there's a solution. You, you do quite a lot of focus and you experience some type of brain freeze in the middle, like, ah, what am I gonna do now? And yes, that happened to me when I tried a few of these problems. So um, don't be afraid if you experience this every now and then. The interesting thing is what you do then. So a better way to think about this is that you start with a problem, you very quickly, try to imagine a naive solution to this. You get started on this path, and then you try a new angle. And with this new angle, you get to a better and more accurate solution. Now that's the real test. Are you able to uh, augment yourself and try new approaches as you are under time pressure? The second test that uh, actually is a check of how your decision-making skills is how you balance accuracy and time. And if you're thinking that you actually need to choose that there's only one of them that matters. If I'm short of time, I need to sacrifice accuracy. Um, actually, if that is how you approach this, uh, chances are that you won't do better than random. What you should be trying is find different approaches, tactics that enables you to improve the accuracy over time. And in scenarios where I've been um, following, working with, for example, racing teams that do formula racing, this is a very common scenario. Like the race engineer 
as a time window between the test and the race. And if the driver would come in and say, oh, by the way, um, the car doesn't handle, I can't drive it. Um, the race engineer can just don't, can't just randomly go and um, update the car and then send the race driver out again uh, just because it's short of time. He actually needs to find some type of tactic that enables him to find some simple way which is slightly better than aim for uh, maybe the optimal solution until there's enough time. And a good tactic to, to deal with this is imagine in a time window is that you have a baseline solution, which is the simplest possible option, and you have an optimal solution. And you try to do both until you're out of time. But you always have something to fall back to, right? which is better than random. So why am I sharing this? Well, interestingly, first takeaway and finding for today is how you make your decisions is way more important than the analysis that you put into them. And here's I show I, I share an, an example, right? Um, in this, uh, how you make decisions proved to be six times more valuable than how much of analysis that went into the precision. And this tells you that if you are in a group of people and they are trying to um, uh, get more data to make a decision, you might advise them, actually, let's talk about how we're going to make the decision instead of gathering more data. The chances are that they end up in analysis, analysis paralysis mode. And a small story here from quite uh, recently is Pfizer BioNTech. When they, um, when they produced the vaccine, which is now part of the um, corona vaccine program, this, one of the smartest thing they did when they were forced to invent this vaccine in incredibly time pressure with a lot of things at stake is that they trained their management leadership engineers, chief engine scientists in decision making before they started the program. And by that, they knew that there will be phases where we, be, we will need to make decisions, otherwise there won't be a vaccine. And we will be in a couple of crisis situations where strong voices will be vocal about that we need more information, yet we need to decide. And I advise you to look up that story and maybe learn from it. It's very telling, it's very interesting. So let's look at a couple of pitfalls that are happening as we try to make decisions. If we would simply uh, do a very simple analogy of what the process might look like, we could you know, talk about it like this. Um, now, interestingly, a lot of focus is put on the left-hand side here ability to make it happen. And you see a lot of language in business literature talking about execution, et cetera, et cetera. Very little focus is spent on this side. And I would argue that this is the one with the higher leverage. How much time does it take you from what you observe when you decide? And when we do this, things are not as easy as we think that they are. So let's have a look at this phase, for example, uh, observing. I'm going to play a small video uh, to illustrate one of the caveats that are in play here. The door study. This video shows a participant from a 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel Levin. Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white-haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. Like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. So, what are we seeing here? Well, as you might have noticed, the um, 
the, uh, the, there was an exchange of person and the guy um, receiving the instruction did not notice. So this is an example of a bias called change blindness. We only notice what we think is important. And by the way, um, when I do presentation with leaders and sometimes have a small trick, I uh, enter a small error somewhere or a spelling mistake to see what they pay attention to. Do they pay, pay attention to the message or do they pay attention to the small spelling error? Anyway, small um, story. Uh, but there's other things that are also in play here. Let's have a look at this factor here. Um, we are seeing and we're trying to figure out what this means. What's tricky here? Well, the trick here is that your brain likes to be right. It hates not knowing. And it would actually force fit reality with a model it's familiar with. If you ever had the experience that you, were, you had a coworker who would seem like a tape recorder, like every problem has the same solution, or you know, I think a story from Apple was that um, uh, Steve Jobs had a reality distortion filter. It's very likely that what's in play here is something called confirmation bias. This is a very strong force, um, and it tells you that most people actually do not try to test what they think is true critically, but rather look for information that confirms it. And this is why one of the reasons why, for example, a researcher, scientist might pay more attention to outcomes that validates what the research is about versus outcomes that invalidates this. And I like this quote. <laughs> Uh, and this might explain why people behave uh, weirdly from time to time. Like if they are faced with some new information that does not fit what they think is correct, uh, they might uh, try to avoid this information rather than uh, absorb it and do something about it. So what does this mean? Well, if we would sum up, sum up the amount of information reaching our eye, that's millions of bits, uh, your brain actually does some clever work in being a processing what type of information do I pay attention to and filter. And then it has a very clever system of parallel processing, which is actually super fast. Um, the challenge is that these two uh, factors I just mentioned impact what we pay attention to. So it's not true that what you see is what you get. It is true that what you see is what you think. So how can we use this in sites? Well, for example, if you are doing some type of visualization, two small tricks you can do, especially imagine that you have um, a board, looks like this, it could be a little bit boring like this, but it has some important insights that you want others to get. Well, two small tricks, the first is, Decide what the story is that you want others to see. This might change over time. Once you've done that, then invite the eye to dot around in the pattern you want them to follow. You might, for example, put in something odd on the board, like this small um, uh, image. That would force the eye to look at the estimation area and ask, like, what is going on here? Maybe the story is that the team um, wonders where's any new um, direction. Uh, or maybe you highlight this and say, what the heck is going on here? That invites the eye to look at, say, what the, etc. So a small um, look at how you can approach the how to make decisions. So if we would you know, make a very naive model of how we could see this, there are stuff that we know, there are stuff that we don't know, and there's unknown unknowns. First, before I go into the tactics you can employ um, and how you can split up this problem, uh, I want to make you aware that if 
you are advising your client based on that you think the problem is here, whereas where is its reality there, you might be doing them a disservice because you are forcing them to see th something which is uh, more complex than it actually really is. So try to avoid this pitfall and instead try to pick the right tool for the job. Now we could actually uh, try to break this down to this type of questions. First, you have some data. If this is the case, you should start trusting it, not second guess it. The second, you have little data. And the third part is learning how to spot hidden opportunities. Now, the good news is there are tactics in how to deal with each of these situations. You don't need to be clueless. And you can train yourself and surrounding in this. And if you do, odds are that you will do a better job than faced with a decision-making situation that is confronting you or matter or a team. And that's one way to split up the problem. And this is actually how we uh, try to train leaders and share information about problem solving inside this program, uh, Active Agile Leadership. And this is how I've been training leaders I've been working with for a number of years. So let's take a crack at the first part just to illustrate how you can use it. So, <clears throat> Uh, let's have a look at this statement. Um, move the decisions to where the information is, which you know, um, could be equalized in, uh, as a very strong agile mantra, you should decentralize decision making. So is this um, always true? Or how, how good is this recommendation really? Now that you know me a little bit, you, 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 you can have a small sense of what's up and coming. Uh, so look at this in this way. Imagine that you're standing in front of these two doors. Now, how many options do you see? Right, so two doors, you see two options. You could make a very simple analogy to think this is the information value I have in front of me. Now, how many options do you see? So if we make this simple example, this small experiment, that we think about the vantage point of the observer, and we say, if you're standing here, you might see two options. And if you're standing here, you see seven options. So being very close to situation, is not always optimal. Sometimes the right thing to do is to take a step back or invite a, a perspective from the outside because you get biased by what you see. And that lowers the information value of the um, decision that you have in front of you. So what I'm saying is not that decentralized decision making isn't good. Um, it is good. It's ex extremely good in dealing with, urge, with decisions that uh, are time critical, for example, uh, and uh, a number of other things. However, if we do that, um, we do not add competence in how to analyze in how I should approach the decision, chances are um, we want to a better decision. So summing up, a couple of good things to remember here. First, master your biases. Right? Be aware that they exist. Um, and if you are aware, you can, you can balance them. You can't you know, get away from them, but you can understand when they are playing tricks with you. The second thing, learn to pick the appropriate tool for the job. Do not guess. If you do this, now you are in control of your decision-making process and you can guide your peers in this. 
thirdly and lastly, practice and critical, critically evaluate. I find it surprising how many people in really high positions that actually never check the, if the decisions uh, are right or turn out wrong. And fact is, if you never evaluate this, chances are that you are not improving your game. So what about the expert? Well, interestingly, um, it's not all bad. <laughs> Experts are extremely useful. And this guy, uh, Doug Hubbard, has done quite a lot of research on when to use and how to use the expert. And his findings that if you use the expert in combination with a quantity technique and some calibration, they are extremely valuable. So, here you see Doug saying, you need to put them into a decision-making process and need to control this process. Then you can make good use of experts. And a small um, heads up, um, it's pretty likely we'll get Doug to come to CRISP um, in um, spring. So keep your eyes posted um, for if he, you know, when he shows up. All right, summing up, First and most important, remember this. You run the tool, don't let it run you. And try to get better at your game. Um, highly recommend Dog's books. And if you want to read a little bit deeper about some of the techniques I showed you, there's an open library you can explore for yourself um, after this session. And that's it. I'm going to say thanks to you all.